Hello, and welcome to our Connecting with Our Community webinar led by Studio Designer CEO Keith Granite. Today, our guest is Lou Taylor, Principal at GP Schaefer Architect. We invite you to submit written questions anytime during the session. After Keith and Lou finish their conversation, we will then begin our audience Q&A. If you go to the GoToWebinar control panel under questions, you will see a dialog box to type in as seen in this screenshot. And now here is Studio Designer, CEO, Keith Granite. Welcome everybody. This is our 11th episode of Connecting Our Community and we're excited that you're with us today. Uh, we have Lou Taylor today, who uh, is somebody I personally work closely with, a studio user and uh, principal who has been with G uh, Gil Schaefer or GP Schaefer Architects in New York for the past 10 years. Um, Lou uh, has a background in finance and management and runs the office. Hey everyone, I keep. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's it's great to have you. Um, so I guess the first question is, you know, how are you? And you know, you're in the start of it all in New York, and I see you in the office today. So I am. I was a brave soul and ventured off into uh, Union Square today. Um, it's calm. It's uh, it's nice to be in the office. It felt kind of unique to get up and. Uh, go through the normal routine that we all go through in the morning, get ready and get out of the house. Uh, but I think we're fair, faring fairly well. I am personally uh, adapting uh, to this new normal that we're all uh, living with right now and uh, trying to get through the challenges of every day. And so the office has been closed for how long now? We, we went remote on March 17th. Uh, so I guess you could say... Uh, you could talk about two and a half months now. Yeah. Or two. Yeah. And just so our audience has an idea, your office is about 34 people, right? And that includes architecture and interiors. We are about 34 people. It includes architecture, interiors, and uh, an administrative team, correct? Great. Okay. So you really had to move fairly quickly. Um, you know, I remember having this conversation with you about how to get people working remotely. What was that like? stressful uh you, you know we're all accustomed to setting up our offices for the most part where everybody works from inside the office and here we were um, faced with a task of getting everyone set up to work from outside the office and gain access to the network the the, the equipment had to be put in place to make sure that we could do that uh, so what we did was we actually ordered several of our staff members laptops in advance knowing that this was coming we did a test run with half of our staff the week before we actually went remote and that way it enabled us to kind of work out a lot of the kinks also formulate a plan and, and kind of inform our people on what's happening it was a little bit of a shock when we announced to people on a wednesday that this friday half the people are going to be working remotely because we want to test uh for the potential that we may go remote 100 percent and uh you know it worked out quite well it was important to test that in advance but it also was a, a real financial investment to be able to do that as well. I mean by buying laptops? And... We had to buy laptops. You, you think about everything that your employees have when they work at their workstation. I mean, some people have needed monitors because the laptop screens are small. We had to buy keyboards, mouse, cabling. Uh, not everyone has wiring at home um, in order to wire up their computer. So we had to think about that or upgrading people's Wi-Fi. And it was a real challenge thinking of all these things. In fact, when we did the remote test, we uh, determined that some of our equipment, which we constantly try to upgrade on a, on a yearly basis, needed to be upgraded. And that first day we went remote, I actually had to stay in the office uh, until midnight upgrading the equipment uh, to make sure that we were in, in, you know, in a good position to do that. So did you actually have to upgrade people's Wi-Fi in their homes? We had to work with people in order to give them switches that they could basically take home and they could splice their internet connection so they could wire up their computers from their router. Uh, what we found was some of the uh, routers that people are using for Wi-Fi at home just weren't fast enough 
uh, with the signal from the, uh, the, the router into their computer. And so what we asked them to do was uh, wire into their laptops and that made for a much better and seamless, but again, you had to give them the equipment in order to do that. That's interesting. So they, they are directly connected with, through a wire to their router. Correct. Uh, and that, that did make a difference. Huge, huge. Because everyone has different equipment at home, different speeds at their residences, depending on where they live. So that was one way to really get everyone, uh, pardon the phrase, but to get them up to speed so that they could really be efficient in their work on a daily basis. Is your, so your drawing platform is CAD, right? Is Correct. CAD? Correct. We're a CAD does office. That reside on a, does that reside on a server in the office? So all of the drawings are saved on a server in the office, so everyone has to access those. So they're accessing those remotely, but the software itself is actually installed on each and every laptop, which enables everybody to access the file, pull it down to their desktop, work on it, and then when they resave it, it puts it back onto the network. No, oh, okay, great. So through all of this, what surprised you the most? You know, um, that's an interesting question. I would say uh, human beings' capacity for burden and stress. And when you think about people's ability to cope with stress, it's a little bit like, I, I liken people to bamboo in a sense that we're a lot, all a lot more flexible and able to adapt more so than when you first think of things or look at them at, at face value. And you know, I found myself very stressed out in the first week to two weeks. Same with our staff. But I think if we all take a step back, things have become a little more normal now. Mm -hmm. It's calmed down. We're not all running to the supermarket paranoid that we can't find toilet paper. Uh, you know, I think normal is kind of, this has become a little more, more normal, even though it's not. And I think the key is that we're all resilient. And I think if we all take a deep breath sometimes when we get really stressed out, we can calm down and adapt and, and make the best of the situation. I think that's what is amazing about all the businesses that are operating right now. Their employees and people are coming together and clients as well. That was my biggest surprise. And then how often do you touch base with the staff? So we touch base, uh, the way our, we set it up was we, this has been a little bit of a learning experience obviously, but we want to touch base with our employees on a daily basis. Our employees are checking in on a, a short five to 10 minute call they check in with their project manager and everyone's just saying hello, getting a little bit of face time that they're missing from being in the office face to face. We don't want people to feel disconnected. We worked really hard to build a culture in their office and, and I'm sure every one of the listeners has done that as well. And you know, you want to try to hold on to that during these times as best you can. So we have that call uh, every day in the morning to kind of start the day off, kick it off, and then people are using various softwares to check in uh, periodically through the day. You know, the thing that's missing, and I'm sure we'll talk about this, but the thing that I find is missing the most is people engaging in the office. You don't get face-to-face -face time, and technology uh, platforms such as this are enabling us to communicate and speak face-to-face, -face. but also uh, you, you want that on a daily basis for mentorship, for learning, for just being able to relate and communicate. So I think you said that you um, bring the whole office together once a week. Is that true? Do you want to... uh, we do. It's uh, it's we every Friday. Typically now we have summer hours, but typically every Friday we bring everyone together at four thirty. Um, and what we do is we try to get everyone on a call together. We're interacting and just sharing what's going on. We give obviously we give administrative announcements and updates. Uh, several weeks ago, you can imagine we were trying to give updates on when we may go back to the office, when things may go back to normal, what our plans are for the coming weeks. And now it's become a little bit more of a fun and social thing where some of the employees are bringing their children on, onto the call to just say hello and wave, or people are bringing their dogs and cats into the call at the end. And it's not a free for all, it's, it's administrative in the beginning, but as the call goes on, it loosens up and relaxes. And it's just a way for everyone to interact and talk. Do you find that most people engage in some level? What was that? I'm sorry. Do you find that most people engage at some level on that call? I'd say that half the office does. Um, everyone's engaged. You can see everyone's face. Mm -hmm. So everyone is totally dialed in. I would say half the people at least talk during the call or have something to share or contribute. So yes. 
That's great. Uh, so, you know, for years we've talked about the pros and cons of working remotely. And, you know, we had Chad Stark on a couple of weeks ago and, you know, he said, who do you hold responsible for your, <coughs> excuse me, digital trans transformation? And he said, you know, it's not our CEO, it's not our CIO, it's COVID. And so it sort of forced everybody to do this. What do you think, you know, now looking forward, is the sort of firm's policy going to look like, do you think? You know, I think that's something that, um, it's gonna be an interesting dynamic moving forward. I think there are a lot of things that we miss being in the office. I think that there are a lot of things that we found out that we can do without being in the office. And so, for instance, you know, remote meetings with clients has become a big thing now. Clients are into it. We didn't think they would be. They are engaged with us. We can meet with them more frequently. So I think that's really important. I think mentorship is a challenge working remotely. You know, there's, we don't have the water cooler conversation. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm just getting a little dry here. It's okay. <laughs> We, we don't have the interaction, uh, you know, in the office. People aren't getting trained and interacting. So that's a big deal. And, you know, I worry how that's going to impact staff in the future. Mm -hmm. Do you, so speaking of how it impacts staff or managing staff, what tools have you been using to help you manage staff, whether it's workflow or, you know, initiatives you have in the office what what tools help with that microsoft teams has been a real blessing mm. we use that constantly we can use that for chatting video calls we are using you know all your typical all your typical um communication means go to meeting has been a big one for us zoom and you, you also, I know that you use Studio for the interior design and you use Dell Tech for the architecture, but that, that allows you to track people's time and manage, you know, the workflow and whether you need to either hire or find work for people, right? So that's a pretty important tool for you. Dell Tech's huge for us. It's, it's our basic platform. We use that for financial, staffing, time entry, billing. Studio has been a godsend. It's really important for data management for our, our design team, our interiors team. They're able to track all their information on a project, communicate remotely. We are able to look up past project history. Um, to be honest, without both of those softwares, we'd be lost. We really would. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you had mentioned to me, um, you actually recently had a project that had fire and how valuable studio was for you to pull the data to for the insurance it's true the information you put in your system is critical you know if you put garbage in you're going to get garbage out and we make sure to put very qual high quality data in there and as detailed and uh as accurate as possible because you never know when you're gonna have to go back and look for that and recently we did have a client about a fire we had to provide that documentation to the insurance company and it was seamless you know the insurance company was totally impressed with what we gave them hmm. just because the level of detail so that they could replace the objects the level of detail the accuracy by room the listing of items the vendor names the value the, the time it was bought you know when you're able to provide those kind of things and we do that actually on every project at the completion so that the client can provide that to their insurance provider so that there's a record from day one of what was in the pro in the in the house. So God forbid there is an issue, it's right there. It's easy to provide. Right. Um, as as you sit in the office right now, um, and you you know we talked about you know sort of the water cooler talk. But what other things do you do you think are missing, or um, you don't quite get the same kind of uh, cultural uh, input? you know, by being away from the office, you know, what other things you think are missing from people working remotely? Well, water cooler is a big thing. Learning through osmosis. I mean, just being in a room and hearing what's going on, 
that's missing. Mm-hmm. You know, we can all go off and work in our houses remotely, but you're not interacting with people. You're not learning as much as you would if you were face to face. And so I think there's a place for all this. I think it's figuring out the balance between how do we work remotely? How do we work in an office? Or is it just a temporary thing? Is it something that you can do with employees? Quite frankly, I believe we're able to do this because we have a strong culture. And I believe we've trained people to the point where they can do this. I do worry what it would be like if we were a startup company, brand new, or what it's like for new people coming into a company, to be honest. Yeah. Well, speaking of strong culture, um, you know, we worked together for a long time, and I think we've done maybe 14 retreats on an annual basis. Um, How important do you think those have been to building your culture? The retreats are critical. We bring every single one of our employees away. It's a two-day event. People get to relax, get to know one another. You're interacting, you're talking, you're sharing personal life details about your family. You just can't help that when you're out of the office. It's you, you break down those barriers. But then we also let everyone talk about the direction of the firm with you, and, and we lead you lead those. And I think that's healthy because everyone at the firm has a say in the direction of the firm moving forward. It's not just management dictating which way we're going to head. We think everybody here has an important voice to be heard. And if you're not listening to those people, then you're failing uh, not only them, but yourself, because they they know your business and and they know what it is that is working on a different level that you may not see. So I think that's been really critical to our culture. But I mean, we do other things to give you an idea that for some of the listeners, we have an annual field trip where we take everyone out to see some of our projects. We have monthly happy hours. Those kind of things are important to get people out of the office and just getting to know one another because the more they like their coworkers, the better your culture is going to be. They don't have to be best friends, but you want them to like each other and be respectful of one another. Yeah, and I have to say that the uh, sort of longevity of your staff is a testament to that. I mean, people come right out of school and they're still there. Um, so I, I think you have a very strong culture uh, because of how much you care about your people. And, and it's, it starts at the top. I mean, Gil's always felt that way. And, and yes. One of the questions I'm sure people have all the time is, you know, during this time, how do you go about sort of procuring new work? And are you seeing, are you getting calls for projects? And if so, is it leading to success? We are receiving calls. Uh, I I think it's obvious that people are spending a lot of time in their houses, so they're thinking about their houses. And I think what you're going to see is when things calm down, people are going to be very busy again, very busy, because we're all sitting home thinking about how do we make life more comfortable in our houses? I mean, I don't know any of us who have spent this much time in our houses. And so I think that's a, a, a big factor in what's to come. We are big on how we procure our business. We've invested a lot of time in how we handle potential clients, uh, the, the, the way and the practice that we go about doing that. And I think that's critical because you want to convey a lot about who you are as a firm, what your culture is. They can see your product on your website. That's, you know, they can shop around for every one of us on our websites. They can see us on social media. There's a lot of platforms where they can get to know us, but who are you as a person and how do, they, how do they identify with you is so critical when you get the chance to make that first impression. Yeah. And so with that, they've accepted, you know, Zoom as a way of getting to know you and learning about their projects. Yeah, it's, it does seem that way. Uh, we're doing a lot of our calls now uh, over, previously we did them all over the phone. Mm-hmm. for a first point of contact and then we would typically like to set up a face-to-face meeting now we're using zoom go to meeting uh you know we, we still obviously communicate via email that, yeah, that's a big way to communicate but uh yeah clients are a lot more open to that i think and it's a good way to get to know them um initially for sure right and you, i know that you have projects all over the country um I think a while back you adopted the uh, use of um, site cameras to look at the sites. Is that 
does that help now that you can people can look at progress? You know, it has helped us. We do have uh, cameras on site. We've invested in uh, some that are pan, tilt, and zoom cameras, which we can control remotely and move around and zoom in. And we can take time lapses of our projects and take a look at them um, remotely. And we can look at them over a six or a nine month or even, you know, two year period if we want to, which is very cool. Um, it, the other thing that we're starting to research and look into is there are firms out there that will actually go on site and do 3D scans of the project. And, you know, one of the challenges we have right now is it's hard to get out on site. Uh, you know, it, obviously it's hard to travel. And so are, are we going to be going out to all of our sites on a regular basis like we normally would? And if we can't, then we've looked into the options of sending out scanning firms, which are actually fairly cheap when you look into them, considering how much it would be to travel and pay people's time. And we can get 3D uh, scans as if you're walking through, uh, you know, similar to what you do on a real estate website when you can walk through a house, very similar to what we can do for our projects and then, you know, monitor and maintain the, the quality of the project that way. Uh, so they come in with cameras and scan the each room is that how that works or yeah that's that's the understanding so what they do is they somehow and i'm not a hundred percent exact on the science but my understanding is they can bring a camera into a room they set it and it does a 3d scan of the room for uh, several minutes and then they move it to another room and then they splice together all the rooms and then you can move from one room to the next yeah well, that's great um so we've talked about clients uh, or potential clients um what do you think is of change being in the heart of New York City could potentially be happening as you come back to work? You know, it's interesting. Uh, we, I, I actually came into the office today because I had a couple of things to take care of. And it, it's interesting just to watch people's interaction. You know, people are a lot more respectful of other people's personal space. I will tell you that. Uh, it's it's you walk in you, you can't help but walk into your elevator and wonder what's this going to be like when everybody uh, you know goes back to the office. But I'm not so sure it's going to change very much in the long run. But I do believe in the short term uh, it will change things. I think people will be looking to work remotely until there's a vaccine or some kind of therapeutic medicine with regard to this. I think people are going to be more likely to think about quality of life. I think people are going to look more to, uh, we always joke about whether it really exists a work-life balance or work integration, uh, but I think the reality is, I think it's causing people to rethink how how they work, where they work, what they do, their, whether they want to live in a city or a suburb. Um, but I got to say, Keith, I believe we're all creatures of habit. And, you know, I, I think back to when 9-11 happened and I think to where we're at now, Air travel went back to normal, I mean, fairly quickly, if you think back to how we all travel. So I, I wonder how much this will impact us. I think it will be different, but I just wonder how much. Yeah. I know. I mean, Americans tend to have a very short memory when it comes to things like this. Um, we'll see. I mean, if I think it comes down to safety. If people feel safe, then I think they'll get comfortable. And if they don't feel safe. I mean, I wondered in thinking about you coming into the office today, like, you know, what was it like to open the front door of the office and get in that elevator? And did they allow other people to be in there with you? And, and you know, literally driving to the city. Did you drive in? Or we, we drove in uh, in record time. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it's a good point you bring up. And uh, it, it, it's a dynamic we're all going to be living with. Uh, I did think twice when I pressed the button on the elevator opening the door and I went immediately to wash my hands, to be totally honest. Uh, it's a different world. It, it, is, it definitely is a different world. I just wonder how long until we all go back to settling into our normal habits. Right. Yeah. Well, I don't think any of us really know at this point, but did you see a lot of people with masks on? There are a fair amount of people with masks on. In fact, we're right in the heart of Union Square where a fair amount of the protests happen. And there's a farmer's market outside today. And you can see everyone out there actually does have a mask on. And people seem to be keeping their distance. So um, seems OK. But there's not a lot of people in the city right now. 
Yeah, exactly. Um, so the other challenge I wonder about when you need to hire people, one, have you hired anybody recently? And two, how do you go about that? In so we have hired, uh, previously we had hired two new people, uh, one, one being an intern from last summer. And so for someone like that, the onboarding process, I believe, will be a little easier because he's familiar with our culture. He spent three months here. He knows our ways. He's been on a field trip with us. He So for him, it's going to be a lot easier of an onboarding and integration within the company. Uh, you know, obviously, only three months, you can only learn so much, but at least he's had that experience. You know, another employee, uh, we're setting up protocol right now and plans on how to onboard, train, and kind of really help ramp up the, the process of learning through a remote platform here. And, and that's something that's trial and error. You do your best, I think. You come up with a plan and you try to figure that out. We've empowered some of our junior staff that are doing a really good job here at the company and ask them to help because they're not too far removed from what it is to be new, to be onboarded. And so hopefully they can help uh, bridge that gap and get that person up to speed uh, you know, and another thing we're trying to do with these people is ramp up their hours. We've spoken about this where in the beginning, they're going to start 20 hours a week, then ramp up to 30 and then 40 so that it's a slow onboarding process rather than just throwing them in the, into the deep end. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's smart um, just because it, it's just going to take time to acclimate them. It is. And do people, are you still seeing resumes come in from people? I imagine there's firms that aren't hiring and that are looking for people. We did actually, it's interesting, you know, we hire uh, a lot of uh, students. We typically focus our recruiting efforts at the University of Miami and Notre Dame. And we were down in February at the University of Miami. We were slated to go out to Notre Dame in March. And obviously that got canceled because of all that's gone on. And it's interesting because I feel for those students because we're seeing all the resumes come in. Mm -hmm. And so they hadn't even gotten to have their career fair. And then all this chaos hit. You have unemployment numbers spiking, firms unsure of where things are going. So we've been seeing a lot of resumes coming in. And quite frankly, I think a lot of people are going to be able to find work in the, fall, in the late summer to fall when things calm down. I'm not sure whether or not there will be a resurgence in the fall that people talk about. but. You know, I do believe that people are learning how to live like this until we can find a vaccine or, or a therapeutic medicine for this. Yeah. And speaking of Notre Dame, I mean, it, it reminds me of 2009 when we had the financial crisis. But I think they said at the job fair in 2008, there were like 70 firms that showed up for 52 graduates. And I'm sure I have the numbers wrong, but it, it was more firms than graduates. And then in 2009, there were like three firms for all those graduates. And it's and there was no, you know, job fair this year. So they're sort of in that same boat where they saw their other classmates you know, be in high demand suddenly. I don't know what their future looks like. Yeah. I think that um, you know, and look, they're they're well educated and they're in high demand because of the education they received there. They'll be fine. Uh, it just may take a year or two to find a place. I agree. I agree. So, Lou, is there anything um, else you'd like to share with, just, you know, in any of your experiences in going through this and in running this, you know, very successful architecture interiors firm that our audience may, uh, you know, benefit from? You know, this is a, there's a few things that I would definitely share, and one being, uh, always keep looking for new work. And even when you're your busiest, that's when you should be looking more because we tend to get real busy and get complacent about thinking about new work. And that's exactly when you need to be looking for it to line it up for the future months because what you don't want to do is ever drive right off the cliff. Uh, so, so my one recommendation would be always, and, and the way to do that is to network, use social media, join groups, uh, that, that you can be a part of and network and find colleagues and reach out to old clients just to check in on how they're doing and how their families are. You never know uh, w when they'll be having a new project or they'll be talking to someone who, you know, if you're on, if you're on their minds, that's a good thing. And, and you always want to be on people's minds. I would also recommend thinking about your 
infrastructure, given your IT infrastructure, your your servers, your your firewalls, your connectivity capabilities, your employees' laptops. I would think of all of those as important investments. They're not the I joke, but they're not, not the sexiest investments, and they're not something that we really want to do. But they're they're I liken it to a really good engine under the hood of a car. And if you really want to be able to have something that performs well, you really want to have the best equipment possible. And I think that's critical for your employees and your firm. I mean, you're you're responsible. It's a really great burden, but it's also a heavy weight that we all are responsible for our employees, their their salaries, taking care of their families and our livelihoods. And so you want to make sure you have the best equipment possible to take care of them and yourself. Um, and I, I, the, the last thing I would say, that I, uh, use this time wisely. I, I know we're all exhausted at the end of the day for some reason in these Zoom meetings. They're, they're, fizz, they're just they're draining. But I would encourage every one of you when you stop work at five, six, seven, eight o'clock, whatever it is, you probably have never had this much free time. And so I would use that time wisely to think about, rethink your business, think about the future, plan for expansion, plan to mentor your staff because you're going to look back on all these times and say, God, I wish I had all that free time back because I could have done so much more with that time. And I, I think that's something we're all going to be saying when we look back. Yeah, I mean, I think we, we're seeing people who are either, you know, working at 110 miles an hour, or it's like, at the end of the day, they're so wiped out. Um, and then I think it's, it's all part of sort of your, you know, your mental state and how to take care of yourself. And, you know, I live on a park where people walk constantly around the neighborhood. And I think people just need to get out and walk and take care of themselves. And I think they're doing that. Um, so, um, some of these changes have been good for all of us. Uh, and you, you know, Keith, I had one more thing that I would that you bring that up. Don't don't forget to put yourself in the shoes of your your coworkers, your employees, and think about the stresses and things that they're dealing with on a daily basis. We've had to rethink some things because you know we have some employees with two children at home, two working parents, and. There's a lot of things going on in this world that, you know, they're not accustomed, they don't have daycare anymore. So their day is turned totally upside down. They wish they could come into the office, right. but instead they're at home doing lesson plans with their kids, trying to occupy their time. And, you know, also think about what it's like to be in their, their house or apartment, wherever they are. You know, there's limitations. I mean, in my household alone, there was a day where I had a similar call to this where I had connectivity concerns. I wanted to make sure I was not going to drop off the call. And my my wife, who works from home all the time, had a conference call. My other son was working from home. And then our other son was taking online exams with his professor uh, to finish up his junior year of college. So there's a lot going on in people's houses that you should think about and try to work with your employees on. Yeah, it's a really good point because... I even think about the people who live alone and, you know, how sort of, you know, how desperate they are to, you know, be in touch with somebody and, you know, and deal with small spaces and just no outlet. Um, and I think it, obviously it's gotten better you know, over the, as the weeks have gone by, but I do think it's a great, it's great advice to yourself in the shoes of other people before you react. And, and, well, the advice that I've heard throughout this whole thing is how you will determine the success. Of sure. So, Lauren, um, I think it's time to open it up to our audience and see if we have any questions out. Sure, Keith. I have a question from Jennifer. Um, she mentioned we also do annual retreats, and she, this question is for Lou. I'm curious, how much of the day evening? Scheduled for meetings, brainstorming, and how much is rest and relaxation? Okay, that's a great question. Thank you. Um, so, we to backtrack a little. We actually set up a committee or some two or three people ahead of time who do a lot of legwork ahead of the retreat. They gather a lot of questions, facts, and data, and they work with us directly, us being management, to kind of put together an agenda and then Keith actually comes out and facilitates that with us. And the first day when we go on site, the first day, 
the majority of the staff has the day free. Uh, senior management or upper, most of management and project managers will have a half day session to talk about the firm direction and things of that nature. So I'd say they have six or so hours free time. Then we have an, a group activity in the afternoon that everybody partakes in. Uh, last year we did archery in the woods, which was a lot of fun. We've done hikes. Uh, we've done cardboard regatta where we made boats out of cardboard and tried to sail them uh, out past the flag and back, which <laughs> was quite fun. And uh, and then the next day, that night, then we have a, 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 a company-wide dinner followed by a bonfire where we get people outside and games and things of that nature, activities like that. And then the second day, we bright and early, we wake up and uh, we typically will have a full day of retreat from nine to five with a break for lunch and some different activities, which are team building activities, which are built into the retreat to kind of have a fun, but also educational and team building component to it. Yeah, Great, Jennifer, Jennifer actually wants to know. Oh, sorry. sorry, Lauren, I just want to That's add okay. to that by saying that no um, I, my personal belief on retreats is the reason why you do it over a two-day period is someday, sometimes you have to sort of tear it down the first day to see what needs to be worked on. You then have to do something really social like a dinner or some event to realize that we're in this together and we like each other. It's, you know, we just sometimes have some issues to deal with. And then the second day is really to build it back up and leave on a very high note, which seems to be you know, how we can believe it. Okay. Um, Jennifer actually wants to know if your firm, do you have summer hours and how do they differ from the rest of the year? So we do have summer hours. We, we, we typically have those uh, when you would expect from Memorial Day through Labor Day. What we do is we close the office informally at one o'clock p.m. on a Friday. We ask people to front load their hours during the week. They are required though to be in on a Friday between uh, a four to five hour period. And, um, but people are not required to work those. If people have a schedule like we had talked about, you know, you have different arrangements, kids, family, or whatever your responsibilities are, you just don't wanna work those longer hours, no one has to. We we want to treat everyone like professionals, like adults, and let them kind of manage their schedule, but the earliest you can leave on a Friday would be 1 p.m. Great. I have a question from Gary. Um, he's asking, do you have any suggestions how small independent interior design firms connect with small to medium-sized architectural firms? Um, the architectural small firms seem to want to do their own design work. Medium size, medium size firms might have a designer or staff on call. Ooh. I think the I think the key for that is, you know, that's a challenge. I, I will admit that. I think the key is to network, to get out to different functions, and don't be embarrassed to put yourself out there. Reach out to people. Um, you know, reach out and comment on their work. Call them up, tell them you'd love to work with them at some point in time, uh, and Maybe no, the first time doesn't necessarily mean uh, that down the road you couldn't either. Um, that's that's the best advice I can give you because I would think, and Keith, you probably have a couple of ideas on this too. Yeah, I, you know, I think that it's all about building relationships. And so if you can identify firms that you think are you're aesthetically aligned to, reach out to them, share your work, share your website, and you know send them something that um, they can hold on to because just going to somebody's website and seeing their work keep you top of mind but if you have a book of work or a portfolio or something that you can share then when that particular architect's looking for an interior designer for their practice uh, they you know that awareness is there because they have something physical um, of yours they also think that you know, many firms have interior architects, have interior designers, and interior designers have architects. But oftentimes, you know, they don't want it all in one house. So they'll, they'll come with their interior designer. Somebody may have an interiors department that they don't work for, dirt work with other interior designers. And Gary actually has a follow up to the question. Um, 
Are there any skills or training that might assure a fit for a specific Lauren, could you repeat that? Oh, You're sure, sorry. Um, Gary's asking, are there any skills or training that might assure a fit for a small independent firm to be able to collaborate with other firms? <laughs> Um, you know, it, it's all about collaboration, right? So if they know how to work, um, you know, collectively with the team, um, the fit can come down to, you know, is the personality fit right, is the aesthetic right? Um, so, you know, I, I don't know if there's any specific skills other than, you know, being a good collaborator. Lou, do you have anything to add to that? I mean... I, I think again the key is like you had said it's get out there it's network it's find people that you align with it's get your get your people out to different types of uh, activities I mean one of the things we do for our employees here is send them to Toastmasters so that they can learn how to talk with people in a better way they can communicate better some people that are a little nervous um, in a public speaking forum and I think things like that Right, can help people represent the firm a lot better. And in doing so, when they represent the firm better, when they go to different, whether it's a, a cocktail hour, whether it's a, a, a book signing, or it's some, some kind of a speaking uh, engagement or an antique show, I think the key is when they're out there, they're representing the firm. And, and they have to be someone who's willing to go out and put themselves out there. And I think you have to help them understand how to do that. I think you have to give them the tools to do that. Yeah, completely agree. Okay, it looks like we have time for just one more question. I have a question from Lee, from Susan. She said, I've heard Gil speak about his library being an important part of your design process. Do your employees still have access to your library? Oh, that's a really, that's, <laughs> oh, uh, I can't wait to tell him that that question was asked. Um, Yes, they do and they don't. And the reason I say they do and they don't is so we, just to give everyone a little uh, window into what we're doing, we've actually announced to our employees that we're not coming back into the office physically until after Labor Day at the earliest. However, what we're doing is we're opening up the office once New York City gives the all clear that if people want to come into the office to access the library or work for a day, just to get back into the swing of things a little, they can schedule to come back into the the office as if it's like a hotel kind of thing where they make a reservation and a certain number of people can come in on a daily basis. I believe we have an office of up to 38 seats and we're only going to allow six to eight people to come in and they can't be making a reservation to come in when any of their um, pod mates or seat mates near them are going to be in. We want them to have access to the library. It's actually a big problem for us right now. And that's the one thing that all of our office is missing, quite frankly. And so it's a hot topic we've been talking about and we need to get access to it on a regular basis as soon as possible. And that's another thing we're all missing working remotely. You just you don't have the, the, the tools for success that you have in the office and the things that we all take for granted, such as a plotter, a copier, a printer, pinup space, conference tables, all these things, even supplies. I mean, we don't have those things and, and that's vital to being successful. So that's a great question and they don't have access, but they will soon. Yeah, I mean, you have a very extensive library, so it's... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't I know I paid for it? <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> no, well, uh, Lauren, do we have time for one more or was that it? Um, I do have a like a, a, a last question. Um, it, this question is from Lisa. She's asking, I know you have an interiors department. Do you also work with outside interior designers? We do have a very small interiors department. Um, it's more of a complementary part of our business. We love to work with outside um, interior designers. And, and part of that and the biggest part of it is it brings a new voice. It brings a new vision into the project. And quite frankly, our, our model, we believe that all of this is about collaboration and bringing great people together for a great project. And so while we do have a small interiors department, we, we also tremendously, prefer, I don't want to know, it's necessarily say we prefer, but we do prefer having other voices on a project. And I think they bring another perspective that we may not necessarily have or think about. And so 
that's a recipe for great success. And we found that to be a great recipe for success. So, I mean, in our interior department is really only three people at this point, and we have, you know, 30, 20, almost 30 architects in the company. So if that gives you a little bit of a breakdown on the numbers here. Yeah, and I also think that you have found that it's the clients that don't really want to go and find another interior designer. They'd rather have you do it or they want to do it themselves. So the ability to do something well through you or office is what, what started that. Um, but the collaboration yeah. with, you know, some fairly big name designers has always been part of the yeah and some people don't want more than one voice on too many voices on the project and some appreciate that collaboration and and we do as well so you know that's that's really why we have that department in place is exactly the reasons that keith uh, mentioned that's great well, i think that, that um, we're out of time Lou, but this has been fantastic and it's great to you know hear your perspective you know most of the time we've either heard designers or vendors and to hear from someone who's actually you know running the office um, both financially and operationally is really important to our our users and members that um, you know want to learn from these tools so really appreciate your time and, um, and support for you. well thank you for having me and uh it's been a pleasure and if anybody has any questions or wants to reach out uh, please feel free I'm, I'm happy to help uh, in any way I can or, or help help the community and network in any way that I can. Thank you. We appreciate that. And Lauren can give people um, how to reach out uh, to us and then we'll send it to you, um, to Lou, if you have any questions you want directly with him. Um, Lauren's going to tell you about next week. Uh, we have Carrie Kravitz of Kravitz. We're very excited to have Carrie. And um, uh, we'll see you next week. So, Lauren, do you want to give people some details? Sure, Keith. Thank you very much. Great session. So, Studio Designer members, you can register for the next session from your dashboard. And if you have any questions about next week's session, feel free to email us at hello at studiodesigner.com. Thank you so much for joining us today.